Hvart skägan dena en sken i gandum. Feknunder främj fodon. Hutha afalengas. Ellen Fremadon. Those are the opening lines of Beowulf, a poem from somewhere between the 8th and 11th centuries that follows the story of a Danish hero slaying a monster that threatens his town. The epic is commonly cited as the first important piece of literature in English history, and it exhibits a level of influence over language, culture, and literature that would never be seen again. Until a young woman in Great Britain watches a little space artwork called Star Trek and felt some inspiration. Welcome to Track Record, I'm your host Rebecca, and this is the story, scandal, and significance behind the first Kirk and Spock fic. Since 1966, Gene Roddenberry's vast array of characters amongst the colorful sci-fi backing of Star Trek would captivate fans across the world. Through fanzines and mailing lists, young writers penned stories of the characters going on wacky adventures, exploring interpersonal relationships, and hypothesizing on the science. One such writer was a young woman named Jennifer Gutridge from Great Britain, who after the season 2 premiere of Amok Time, would go on to write her own story, The Ring of Sashon, somewhere in 19. 68, which would basically change the face of fandom as we know it. Feeling is not much to go on. Sometimes a feeling, Mr. Spark, is all we humans have to go on. Captain, you almost make me believe in luck. Why, Mr. Spark? You almost make me believe in miracles. Cook and Spock's homoerotic relationship has always filled the imaginations of young queer people and bored college girls across the country. I can't blame them. The ship was a huge part of me discovering my own lesbianism, and is still one of my all-time favorites to create art for. It makes sense that these two's friendship would capture Jennifer's attention and create a group of like-minded folks who would be very passionate about the Ring of Sashon. One problem with the whole of this story is just how hard it is to fully prove any of its history. The problem with pre zine era fandom is its lack of a footprint. Most of Jennifer's fix were pass-arounds, which were literally just single copies of stories that had to be sent to you by someone else who had already had the story. You had to be invited to get on this mailing list as well. If any of you were around for the pre-live journal days, the digital equivalent of this is email lists. But people in the 60s would literally be mailing each other horny Star Trek fix in the US Postal Service. So can I say with full confidence, yes, Jennifer wrote the first Cook Spock fic. No, people were writing these since the first season in all likelihood, but most of those have been lost to time. So when I call OOS the first, I don't mean literally. I mean it in the way academics refer to the first novel or the first poem. It's the first that we have documented evidence of, and further, it's the first that we have proof of its influence. The story itself runs about 40 pages and follows Kirk and Spock as they are marooned on a planet while Spock is going through Pond Fur, and the two have to uh, fuck or die. But more than the physical, the fic explores the romance between these two men that bloomed from their mutual respect and trust. Now, if you're a connoisseur of chaos fics, you'll probably be saying, no, wait a damn second, I've read this one before. And you probably have in some form or another. The tropes that Jennifer more or less created her comfort, Ponfer, and sex in a cave are still huge in the fandom today, and people are still making stories with the same themes. It's weirdly comforting to me that the same human stories that captured our hearts 50 years ago are similar to the ones that we still love now. So it should come as no surprise that the fic was a huge success in the past round circuits. In fact, it became such a huge hit that suddenly the fic was getting circulated outside of those circles. Multiple copies were being typed and sent out. Many fans say that they remembered the story skyrocketing in availability somewhere between 1973 and 74. Remember, by available, I still mean that there was a level of difficulty. The secrecy of queer zines is a whole nother topic that I will make a whole video about if you specifically would like that. Copies of the fic remained in the fandom for decades after its 1968 creation date, and it passed through the hands of many big name fans, including the hands that made the zine Alien Brothers. Alien Brothers was a fanzine published in 1987 by Helena Seabright. The zine was created after the editors of another popular zine refused to publish one of Seabright's fics due to its more raunchy and uncanny nature. In turn, AB included a far more diverse catalog of art and fics, including several smut fics and erotic art. One notable example was the story Love Slaves by Dale uh, Compion, which included a scene of, um, 
can I say this on YouTube? <laughs> um, look to your left. Yeah. Now look to your right. Yeah. Up to 100 the shoulder. hundred percent of those people have had their arms in your ass. Up to the shoulder, honey. The zine was highly controversial because of this, with many crying mole panic. However, AB was not just limited to criticism by conservative fans, no. It also received backlash for many other reasons, like its long overdue release date. Though, as somebody who makes zines, I have to say I sympathize. Even more seriously, however, was that it included two stories published without the consent or knowledge of the authors, one of which being, you guessed it, Ring of Sashon. Somehow, Seabright had received a copy of the fic and it was included in the lineup. We know that the copy Seabright received was not the original typed form, however, since this version that appears in AB had many typos consistent with later editions, so to speak. The exact identity of who submitted the story is unknown, but we do know that the Alien Brothers team was well aware of its legacy and authorship. The story has never before appeared in a fanzine. It is one of the first, and certainly the best, underground KS tales, circulated very privately and discreetly in manuscript and photocopies only. Ring of Sashon set a pattern for many early KS stories, and had its imitators, but none surpassed it. The British author is well known for his sensitive and accurate character portrayals, and skillful handling of plot, action, description, and unusual themes and ideas. While there were contemporary fans who were against the unauthorized publication, there were also many who appreciated its new, much more accessible availability. See, the fic had basically become fandom legend at this point, but was still, to some extent, limited to those mailing lists even though those lists were much broader. Zines were way easier to get to, often sold at cons or advertised by other means. OS appearing at Alien Brothers meant a whole new generation of fans could engage with what was basically the Jane Eyre of Star Trek. Further, many felt like it was high time Jennifer received wide known praise and respect that she deserved. However, the issue of consent was still present. While Jennifer didn't learn of its publication until decades later, the author of the other unauthorized fic did take more media action. The conflict between that author and Alien Brothers also caused a bit of an investigation to take place behind Seabright's identity, and eventually it was discovered by comparing the whale on certain typewriter letters that Seabright and the author of the fisting fic were both pseudonyms for Barbara P. Gordon, a well-known artist in the fandom and huge collector. Barbara, please! I am utterly obsessed with the Angela Lansbury-esque work that went into falsifying this. Murder, we wrote. Really, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But this all to say, while Alien Brothers was a pretty incredible undertaking that widely engaged tons of new fans, it was not a victimless action. When she did learn of the publication, Jennifer was less than pleased. This is totally justified. The legality of fanfiction was still very much up in the air at this point in history, and queer fic presented a whole different danger. Having such clear ties to gay life, regardless of Jennifer or any author's own sexuality, could lead to legal repercussions. Queerness was illegal in most countries in the 1970s, so this aspect of Jennifer's life being outed could be hugely detrimental. I mean, she said it best when she said, I want to meet Nimoy, but not in court. Even on a less fatal scale, having your work published in a form that you didn't approve would be heartbreaking. I've experienced this in smaller ways before, people posting sketch versions of my art to different platforms without my consent, and it sucks. Jennifer's work was known for its quality and use of grammar and syntax, and the version AB had had typos and versions of words that were not Jennifer's preferred types. That would be hugely invalidating. And I don't mean to directly villainize Boba P. Gordon either. Again, we have no way of knowing if she published this story knowing Jennifer had not consented, nor can we really moralize this woman's actions from nearly 40 years ago. She was a real person, and herself had a huge effect on Trek fandom. So this single action shouldn't define her. But I do want to point out how instances like OOS could have and often did put fans in danger. Luckily, however, this did not seem to dampen Jennifer's love of fandom, and she continued to be a vocal fan historian and legacy member for years. It's a bit difficult to fully encapsulate the huge impact Jennifer's work had on Star Trek. She was an early pioneer of so many tropes that remain today, and her style influenced countless young writers across the world. I mean, as much as I meant it as a joke earlier, cave sex literally could be its own tag on AO3, and her comfort was barely a thing before her. What's fantastic about Jennifer's story, however, is that it doesn't end with fanfiction. 
In 1976, one of Hotwar Fix, The Winged Dreamers, that's difficult to say, was officially published into canon by Star Trek and became one of the few licensed work to allude to romantic KS. Her second canon fic, In the Maze, was published in 1978 and is probably one of my favorite pulp stories of that era. I mean, look at the character list. Crab Monstrosity is listed before Cook. What is not to like about that? Sadly, Jennifer passed away in 2004, and in losing her, we lost a talented writer and an influential part of a rich history. She will be remembered for decades to come as an inspiration to many and a pioneer of fan works. Look, we would not be talking about Star Trek still if it wasn't for slash fiction writers like Jennifer. And I mean that in a literal sense. They very much saved the show from cancellation with letter writing campaigns and fan forums. If you want to know more about this, watch Jesse Gender's video on the topic. Actually, just watch all of her videos because they are much better than mine. People like Jennifer and Gordon are the reasons I have the platform I have today, and to them, I can only say thank you. Also, where did they keep finding lube in the cave? I need to know for a fund. Alright, so that was that. I'm not gonna lie, I was very excited to make this video. This is probably one of the first stories that I learned when I first started to get into fandom history. So I hope that I did it justice and that you guys enjoyed it. Um, this was admittedly very difficult to script. Maybe one day I will revisit this and give it another shot, but for right now, I'm pretty happy with this. I also apologize if my voice was a little tired through this. I just gotten off conference season and then recorded this after Labor Day, so... The box was a little tired. The, bo the voice box was a little tired. Uh, but you were good, Liz. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you next time. So, yeah. I hope to see you guys then. And uh, keep it tight. Keep frosting.